Good morning, everybody. Well, there's people here from all around the world. That's good. <laughs> so uh, today's uh, so-called class, actually discussion, is about uh, the sixth uh, patriarch, or these days known as the Six Ancestors uh, uh, Platform Sutra, which is uh, attributed to Huayan, the sixth patriarch. So this uh, this particular sutra is very interesting because it's the uh, it's considered the uh, seminal or original uh, foundation for modern Zen teaching. So uh, as you probably know, uh, many different kinds of Buddhism and even different kinds of Zen have different teaching styles. So this teaching style that we associate with uh, Zen. I know that many of us, like in our school, myself included, uh, came to Buddhism through Zen. And we're not all that familiar with other kinds of uh, Buddhism, but uh, I've lived in Singapore for a long time. And um, if you're raised in like a Buddhist country like Singapore is, uh, you'll encounter many different styles and many different kinds of of Buddhism, while in the United States uh, uh, we're uh, mostly associated with the uh, Zen school, and even the non-Zen schools use Zen-style stuff to uh, teach, of course, and vice versa. So um, I came to Zen originally uh, through uh, uh, Japanese-style Zen. Of course, that's predominant here in the United States, which is why we use the word uh, Zen, which is a Japanese word for uh, Diana or meditation in uh, in Chinese is Chan in Ma in Mandarin Chinese, so um, and in Korean it's Sun. So um, uh, this text is also one of the oldest printed texts, and uh, it is uh, it contains. Uh, most of the modern elements that we associate uh, with Zen. You know, it has uh, the Kongan in it. It has um, this emphasis on experience rather than uh, understanding. So uh, when the Buddha saw old age, sickness, and death, he uh, directly experienced uh, suffering. So I'm sure the Buddha's intelligent young guy, he had definitely heard about old age. He'd heard about death. He'd heard about suffering. He'd heard about sickness. But then, and this is the important thing, when he leaves his uh, kind of like bubble, he has a direct experience of it. Right? So um, when I think about direct experience, I always use the example of a banana. So I had this really kind of uh, uh, aha moment when I uh, went to Mexico and being from uh, Kansas and Nebraska area, uh, we don't have many banana trees growing around here, right? All of you for, here from Kansas know that. So um, first time I went to Mexico, uh, there was a banana tree out, uh, just outside my hotel room when I went there to teach and uh, I came out in the morning, I looked up and I saw this banana tree and I was just shocked because uh, even though my father owned a grocery store and, and he sold bananas all the time, so he'd see bananas and he'd even see whole bunches of bananas, but he never, I never saw him on the tree. When I saw the tree, I was shocked because the bananas point up and I always thought they pointed down. <laughs> so that was like a, we might, in modern Zen, we say, well, that was like an enlightenment experience, right? It's just kind of like waking up to uh, what is already there, you know? So if you try to uh, explain a banana to somebody, uh, you can go on forever. You can show the video, you can play the tape, you can show them pictures, you can pantomime a banana. Uh, but there's nothing like just peeling it and eating it, right? Then you have the direct experience. So Zen, just like with the Buddha and his enlightenment, 
the emphasis is on uh, direct experience. So I always say that, uh, well, when Buddha left home, uh, he didn't move to a library and, and start pouring through the stacks to find a book that could explain uh, suffering to him and how to take away this suffering or answer the great question which comes from human suffering, which is, what are we really, you know, why are we here? It all seems so futile if you look at it from the point of view of suffering, right? You're born, you die. Eh. So uh, when he leaves home to answer this big question of life and death, he doesn't uh, move to a library. He experiences some teachers, but he finds out that these teachers uh, they don't have the answers to, the, to this big question. So in the end, he just goes and sits underneath a tree. And then he has some kind of direct experience, right? He, he says, I, he sees his true self when he sees the morning star. So he has a direct experience. So Zen is, and Zen is all about uh, allowing you to have this direct experience. It's not about explaining anything to you. And I think if you look closely at the sutras too, they may seem like explanations, or they may seem kind of philosophical, but uh, actually what they're doing is pointing towards you having an experience. So uh, it's kind of interesting because the platform sutra plays on this all the time, right? So it's uh, even this first chapter, it's always about experience versus uh, understanding. So many of the dramatic uh, kind of tension elements that are in this uh, sutra revolve around uh, direct experience rather than understanding. So um, uh, when the sixth patriarch first arrives at the fifth patriarch, Hong Ren's uh, temple, which is in more in northern China, while, while the sixth patriarch lives in uh, southern China, in, in, in Guangzhou, in Guangdong province, in extreme southern China. When he first gets there, you know, the, uh, the, sixth patri or the fifth patriarch accuses him of being a barbarian. So uh, behind the idea of barbarian is, well, you don't know anything. Uh, you know, he, he can't even read Chinese characters. He never studied Buddhism. You know, he, he's a woodcutter from uh, a little village outside of Guangzhou, China. So to Northern people, they're barbarians. They don't know anything. What are they ever going to learn, you know? So he accuses of being a barbarian. So uh, the Sixth Patriarch says something interesting, which actually points to the experience that he had had when he had heard uh, the diamond sutra, one line out of the diamond sutra re, uh, recited by a monk. So it wasn't so much about uh, what, what the passage was or whether he understood it or not, it's that he had an experience of his true self. So when the Buddha sees the star, he has an experience of his true self. When the sixth patriarch has this experience, after he hears this one line walking by this monk after he delivers some firewood to a shop in Guangzhou. He, um, he has an experience. So uh, then that means he, he knows, meaning that he directly experiences, kind of like I suddenly knew that bananas point up on the tree. So he has this direct kind of experience. So it's, uh, it's in his guts. It's not a conceptual manipulation or somebody told him something and then he thought that was great but rather it's based on a direct ex experience. So when the, when the fifth patriarch says you're a barbarian, he knows how to respond. You know, say, yeah, people, uh, people in, uh, can be from the north or the south. They can be stupid or smart, but actually it doesn't make any difference because uh, Buddha nature isn't dependent on, on that. You know, then the fifth patriarch says, eh, <laughs> and this is not the usual guy, you know. So he has some actual direct experience of his true self, just like uh, the Buddha had. So in this sutra, there's always these kind of like opposites playing off against each other. 
And that's because the teaching of the sutras is not about opposites thinking. In fact, opposites thinking uh, will lead you into trouble if you're attached to it. So there's nothing wrong with opposites thinking. Anytime we start thinking, we will always be thinking in, in terms of opposites, just the nature of thinking, you know? So you'll have subject, object, you'll have win, lose, you'll have moral, immoral, you'll have true nature, not so true nature. You know, it's, it's always involved in opposites, which is one reason that Zen Master Sung Sung said, uh, open your mouth is a mistake, right? Because anytime you're opening your mouth, you're gonna be using opposites thinking. So that's why sometimes we say that Zen is uh, before thinking or Zen Master Sung Sung was always teaching don't know. So don't know just points to your mind, which is uh, before thinking. And this before thinking mind doesn't mean there's no thinking. It just means you're not attached to thinking. So it's your non-attachment mind, the mind that isn't suffering because of its attachment, its desire, its anger, its ignorance. It's uh, before that. It's about letting go of that so you can return to your true self. And this return is a natural event. It occurs naturally if you just let go of your thinking for a second. So the Buddha lets go of his thinking for a second. Ah, there's the morning star. Pow. Ooh, oh, yeah, right, right. And when the six patriarch is leaving this guy's shop after delivering wood and he hears this monk saying one line out of the diamond sutra, boom, you know, he lets go and he sees, oh, that's what that's about, right? So, uh, and then later when the six, uh, when the sixth patriarch is explaining this uh, famous line out of the diamond sutra when thinking rises in your mind, don't attach to it, uh, he also gets a a realization, oh, oh yeah, that's it, I get it. So all of these, the one way to think about this is not that these either uh, things like konons or this talk right here or reading sutras or listening to whatever is about explaining anything to you. What it's actually doing is pointing towards something. So even though this uh, sutra in other chapters gets a little explainy, uh, the purpose isn't explaining, the purpose is to point towards something. So that's what the, all the kind of drama going on here is about. So uh, one, of the, one of the differences between uh, the Sikh uh, Huaynung, the Sikh patriarch, the Sikh ancestor, and the Buddha is that uh, Huaynung is poor, right? While the Buddha is rich. Uh, the Buddha is fairly well educated. Uh, Huaining doesn't even know how to uh, read or write. Um, the Buddha comes from good circumstances. Huaining comes from bad circumstances. You know, his, his father had been uh, kicked out of government and forced to move south to where the barbarians live. You know? So there's all of this kind of dramatic tension that's created by the way you usually think of a Buddha versus uh, Huaynin, with, who has uh, uh, none of those supposed social characteristics, right? He's not educated. He's not high class. He's just a, a guy out in the back who works in the kitchen, right? So all of this is pointing towards something, is pointing towards your original Buddha nature is not dependent on any of these opposites that we think are so important, right? Did you go to school? Do you come from a good country or a bad country, right? All those kind of things. Do you know how to speak this or speak that? Do you know this? Do you know that? Uh, how are your clothes? How's your hair doing today? My hair is doing great. So all those kind of things are all things that we are attached to, you know, we're attached to these opposites kind of uh, thinking. So the point of the uh, sutra is to take away those opposites by uh, creating this dynamic tension between a, uh, a low life like Hui Nung and the Buddha who's, uh, you know, uh, very high class. So what that's pointing to is uh, kind of the non-duality of your original true self. So your true self doesn't have uh, uh, 
duality. It, it means become one. So that's uh, become one thing, boom, that comes about through direct experience. You can't think your way there, but you can't experience it easily. Anytime you let go of your thinking, actually it happens. So that's the dramatic tension that's created by uh, uh, this opposite uh, thing inside uh, the sutras. So after he gets transmission, uh, all these monks are chasing him because they think he doesn't deserve it. So there's another opposite. The people that deserve it and the people that don't deserve it. You know, like we must deserve it because we've lived at this monastery for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Who knows how long? While, while Huaynan is just this guy that showed up and worked in the kitchen, right? So that creates a, an interesting kind of tension. So in this one monk who used to be a general in the Chinese army, which means he's no joke, uh, catches up to the sixth patriarch and is trying to get back the robe and the bowl, which is a symbol of transmission. You know, uh, the sixth patriarch just lays it on, on, a, on a rock and hides behind a tree because he doesn't want to get killed. And then the, the, the monk, Hui Ming, uh, tries to pick it up, but he can't, right? So uh, what that means is he doesn't have the experience, which would be the basis of him actually uh, having some connection to the robe and the bowl, which symbolizes some kind of direct experience or attainment, right? So uh, again, this, there's this dramatic tension between this monk who wants to kill him and the sixth patriarch who uh, is not actually attached to life and death can use this circumstance to actually teach this monk, right? So then you have one of these uh, first situations where he asked this monk, you know, what is your original face, the face you had before, even before your parents were born? So when you think about this question, you, know, you can't think about it because it leads you to before thinking because it's not a thinking of question. It's a before thinking question. So here we have in this sutra, the first um, examples of these before thinking questions. So as you probably know in life there, and everybody's experiences, there are two kinds of uh, questions. There's thinking questions like, uh, how do I get to the Costco in Kansas City? So I was looking online yesterday, and if you go there, there's a bunch of maps that lead you to, I don't know, there's three or four Costco's in Kansas City. And then it, it knows where I am in Lawrence, Kansas. And it shows me all kinds of different routes. You know, there's better ones, there's worse ones, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I can think about that and I can figure out how to get to the Costco in Lenexa or something, right? So that's a thinking question. And in this case, it's answered by a Google map and it traces it out very clearly. And when I look at that, I can think about it. You know, I go down route 10. Well, I've been down route 10 thousands of times. So I kind of know where it's pointing me although I've never been to that Costco. Anyway, that's a kind of thinking question, right? Then there's the other kind of question, a very important kind of question, particularly for us as human beings. And that question is our uh, before thinking questions. So uh, we're always asking these in Zen, but they all boil down uh, to one basic one, what are you? So that's the question the Buddha faced when he saw old age, sickness, and death, because inside of his mind arose this big question, which couldn't be answered by thinking. That's why he's spending six years running around trying to find the answer, because he isn't going to get it from anybody else. He isn't going to get it from a book, and a bird isn't going to whisper it in his ear. He's going to have to find it himself through his own direct experience. So that's really interesting. So that's what we, in Zen, we call it a before thinking question. So uh, the famous Japanese Zen master Ikkyu said there's a really only one koan, what are you? So they're all uh, just different ways of asking that same question. So he says, when the sixth patriarch asked Hui Ming, uh, what is your original face to face you had before your parents were born? Well, he can't answer that through thinking, so he's driven to before thinking, then boom, and he said, oh, that's incredible. I'm just like a person who knows for himself drinking water, whether it's hot or cold, right? 
So that also a point, points towards direct experience. So when you drink your coffee in the morning, I had a couple here, uh, you know when you taste it, yeah, that's hot. Oh, that's good. I like hot coffee in the morning. You know, I'm not drinking cold coffee. I'm not drinking iced coffee. I didn't go to uh, Starbucks to get an iced coffee. I'm right here at home and I have a hot coffee. So I know all of that stuff through direct experience. No need, uh, nobody needs to tell me. Now you could point to my coffee on the counter and say, hey, that's hot. But I wouldn't necessarily know if it's far enough away from me. Or they could say it's just lukewarm. Or they could say, well, it's been sitting there so long it's cold, right? So, but I could find out the answer which one is actually correct through some kind of direct experience. I could go over and put my finger in it or I could sip it or I could just touch the cup and probably know. So we're doing this all the time because there are an infinite number of uh, before thinking or direct experience kind of thinking questions. In fact, it goes on all the time, right? But usually we're carried away by our, by our opposite thinking and we're attached to it and that's what leads to suffering. So all this, co all this uh, problems that we have in the world, according to the Buddha, is caused by our attachment mind. So we have this like and dislike mind and that's what creates uh, human suffering. And then the way to let go of that is uh, through direct experience, which is not attached to like and uh, dislike. And then we can naturally just naturally, if it's a really good word, it just naturally happens. You don't have to do anything. Return to your original true self. So that's what the six patriarch experiences. That's what the Buddha experiences. That's what we experience all the time, but you know, you don't believe it. So sometimes we say, well, this is a wake up experience, right? When he came out of the shop after delivering the wood, uh, the six uh, Wei Nung has this wake up experience. <gasps> you know, so that also is a direct experience. So this morning when he woke up, you know, you weren't thinking uh, good or bad. Should I wake up or should I not wake up? You know, you're just laying there asleep and then you wake up. <gasps> So when you wake up, you realize, oh, wait, I'm laying in bed, you know, so you may have been dreaming, maybe you weren't dreaming, but you woke up, then you had uh, an experience. And at that moment, it, you're awake. So it's called waking up. So this is a, uh, uh, a direct experience, which we use to explain this waking up to your true self. It's called waking up. It's also called enlightenment, right? So when you turn the light on in the room, it doesn't make any difference if it's like King Tut's tomb and it's been dark for 3,500 years or something. Uh, when you turn the light on, boom, instantly the light goes on. So we say, well, that was an enlightening experience, right? <laughs> and which means the light just went on, which means there you are, and you just had this experience of, of the light being there, right? So all of these words and all of these teachings and these wonderful stories and these kongans and this sutra and the diamond sutra and all the sutras, uh, they're all just ways of pointing. So they're a finger pointing towards something. Hey, look, right? And in this case, what the finger is pointing to is what you really are, not what you think you are, not what some Zen teacher told you were, or even the Buddha, but for you to have the experience yourself. So that's why this platform sutra is so important for the teaching style, because Zen teaching style isn't about scholarship, right? It, like the, the sixth patriarch Wei Nung didn't know anything. And uh, so it's, it's all about uh, pointing you towards having this experience. And it's a, it's a wake up moment. So many times in Zen, they'll say, uh, you have to uh, uh, get enlightenment, right? But you don't get enlightenment. All you do is actually, maybe a better way to say it is you return to what you already had, to what you already know, but you've forgotten it because you're drawn away by desire, anger, and ignorance. So it's just like turning on the lights in the room. It, uh, it lights up what's already there. So you too, when, when you get, uh, I forget, our uh, uh, 
uh, Barbara Rhodes, uh, Zen Master Song Hyung, our school's head Zen Master. Um, uh, her theory is that people get enlightenment maybe five or 600 times a day, which is probably true. I agree with that, maybe more. Uh, the problem is you don't believe in it, and then you fall back into your uh, desire mind, your desire anger thinking mind, and then you, uh, you, you kind of become separated from it. So actually all you're doing, and this is why uh, Zen masters, in fact, uh, right after the sixth patriarch, uh, start using these kind of shock techniques, you know, so they'll hit you with a stick or they'll shout, ah! You're right. So then you jump. So then you have that experience, you know, at that instant in time, you have let go of your thinking for sure. So that's what those techniques are about. They're just returning you to what you originally are because that shout doesn't have this or that. It doesn't have good or bad. It doesn't have, oh, he scared the hell out of me with that one. You know, it just has <laughs> at that moment. You're just, uh, you're let go of your thinking and you return to this uh, moment, which is this moment world. So all of these ideas are in these sutras. They just get coalesced in this particular sutra. And, and then it's handed down as this Zen teaching tradition. So our Zen teaching tradition begins with this particular sutra. And as near as I can tell, I've been reading the last couple of days because they had to lead this discussion, uh, all the elements are there. You know, some of them aren't quite formed yet, but they all are there. And particularly, it was interesting of these shock treatments, right? So it's uh, a lot of sutras are very explainy, but this one is not so explainy, right? It uh, introduces these kind of shock treatments to the uh, student so the so-called student can wake up because you're not a student of anything because you already have it so how are you going to teach somebody about something they already have well you just kind of have to point it out to them you know yeah it's true bananas do point up on the tree <laughs> you idiot <laughs> so that's the way it is and it's exactly like that so it's uh, all these stories in here are very uh, good, you know, like the one about the, the wind and the flag. Uh, and then he says, no, it's your mind. So that's uh, pointing towards something, that story. And then that kongan, that becomes a kongan, and that kongan is used by us uh, to allow uh, myself and you and everybody to have that kind of experience, right? Or Zen Master Sung Song took those two poems and turned them into a, a, a kongon, right? So one, um, uh, uh, Shen, Shen Chu's poem says this, Huai Nung's poem says this, but then you have to hit that, right? Line by line by line by line. So all of those are just techniques for allowing you to realize or manifest your true self. It isn't about understanding, it's about experience. So that's uh, the big theme of this particular sutra and why all this uh, action is going on. I met, I, it must have, I, I never saw one. Oh, somebody must have made a movie out of it because there's enough action elements here. And they could probably be massaged a little bit to create some kind of interesting, uh, 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 dramatic, uh, progression, you know, <laughs> uh, because it, uh, it is pretty interesting. To me, it's always been the most interesting sutra. Maybe that's because I'm interested in Zen, not the other stuff so much. Okay, so uh, uh, I think it's important to read this, but not attached to it. And it is interesting, but what it points to is even more important. And what it points to is uh, you and me waking up in just this moment. So thank you for listening. So now we have some time for some questions. Does anybody have any questions? Any kind of questions, okay. The quantum? Yes. Why is it a sutra? Because it's not the words of the Buddha. Right. So how did it become actually a sutra? 
Yeah. I don't know. That's <laughs> oracle this and that. <laughs> but it's famous for being supposedly the only sutra uh, which is not attributed to the Buddha. Although the uh, Vimalakirti Sutra is also kind of like that, right? So there's a lot of other characters playing out here in the history of Buddhism. It's just that the Buddha is a seminal figure. And for us, uh, Hui Nung is a seminal figure. And uh, uh, actually, I don't know how it got the reputation of being uh, a sutra. It was probably pr promoted by powerful people at a particular point in time, and that's, that's how it happened. You can read it in Wikipedia, or, or there's whole books about this, about its history. You know? So it has this part, this part, this part, this part. Uh, some of them are uh, quite explainy, and some of them are uh, historical, or at least they uh, portray themselves as being historical fact, although nobody really knows for sure, because it's quite a while ago, you know, it's uh, 1300 years ago. So the six, uh, Hui Nung died in 713 or something like that. So that's, that's a while ago. And this is one of the earliest printed books you know, so it was actually printed rather than being written out by, uh, by hand. So uh, the history of sutras, of course, is quite obscure just because it's so long ago. But if you look at biblical text or uh, uh, whatever, they, they get pretty fuzzy too when you start mixing them all up and there's this tradition and that tradition. And then at different periods of time, certain texts will be in ascendancy at other times they'll they'll be used as toilet paper. So, you know, all this stuff is going on all the time. And blah, 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 blah. So actually, I don't think that's so important. What's important is that you wake up. That's what's important. So this is just uh, a, a text, uh, which uh, indicates some very interesting techniques. And I think that's its value. Uh, I would, uh, I, one time I saw this, uh, uh, kind of four box categorizations of teachings. So there, there can be two kinds of teachings. There can be uh, real ones and fake ones. And then there can be two other kinds. There can be uh, good ones and bad ones, okay? So in those four boxes, you could have bad teaching, which is good, but you could have good teaching, which was not real, right? So, um, it actually doesn't make any difference if this sutra is historically real or not. It's very good teaching. So those categorizations would be based on wisdom, right? So it's about uh, wisdom emerging in your mind through your direct experience is what the important thing is. And whether it's historically accurate or not, or how it came to be, or uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe some British scholar a hundred years ago rewrote wrote this text and you don't even know that. But it doesn't make any difference about the quality of the teaching. And that can only come up, your, uh, ex it's your experience, right, which is important. Not that kind of academic or historical or scholarly kind of stuff. So uh, it, to my mind, this uh, particular sutra is, is very good at uh, pointing you towards having that experience. And some of the uh, uh, scholarly or historical dimensions of it are interesting, but really what's important is waking up right now. In fact, that's all there is. So to the extent that that sutra makes that point, that's good. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question about Kung on practice. Um, and does the Kung on point directly to something or is the response to the Kung on supposed to point directly to something or both? Yeah, both. All of the above. <laughs> Usually in Zen, it's all of the above, all right? <laughs> so uh, the way I think about Kung on is it, it's a question, it's a before thinking question, which means it's a question which if you think about it, you kind of get further away from the answer. And the less you think about it, ironically, you get closer to it, right? So I always think of kongans as evocative. So it's intended 
as a clever little technique to evoke an experience from you. So it's, so if I'm the Zen teacher, uh, the Kongan interview or Kongan an answering, asking session is not about me, the teacher. And it's not even about you, the student, because there's something before that, and that's our true original natures, right? So they're not based on uh, whether you're Leatris or not, and they're not based on whether I'm a monk or not, and they're not based on whether you live in Topeka and I live in Lawrence. It's always before that. So it's pointing to your original nature, which is not dependent on any circumstances. It's not dependent on this, that. It's not even dependent on life and death. It's before that. So that's why the Buddha had so much trouble teaching, because he's talking about something that can't be talked about. So that's why Zen Master Sung Sung said, if you open your mouth, it's already a mistake. But of course, that opening of your mouth is usually conditioned by your likes and dislikes. If it's not, then it's true speech, right, which is direct speech. Uh, so that could be uh, a verbal answer to one of these before thinking questions, right? So that's why I think it's evocative, right? And anybody that's done any practice and has a so-called answer a Kongon has had this evocative experience. That's why you go, oh, right? Or you think, what, that's the answer? That's so stupid. Well, of course it's stupid. It's intended to be stupid. In fact, the reason you can't answer the Kongon is because it's too simple, not because it's too hard. So you always think, oh, that's a hard Kongon. You know, but that's your thinking mind. You've made hard and easy. You made this is difficult. Oh, this is a breeze, right? So it's not about, it's not about getting anything. It's about evoking this experience of your true self, which is not a thing, right? So there's nothing to get. In fact, it's not anything, but it is something. But then I've gone into opposite thinking, right? If I say it's nothing, then it's something. If it's something, then it's nothing. So in the last chapter of the sutra, that's what the sixth page of uh, Wei Nung says, right? He says, if they say this, you say that. If they say that, you say this. <laughs> so what that does is it cuts off your attachment thinking for just a second. Then something else can happen, right? So... Uh, when I'm walking down the stairs of my hotel room there in Mexico City, I'm not thinking about the biological history of banana trees. I'm just, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm thinking more about the good cup of coffee that's down in the lobby rather than the banana tree. But then you, you know, the banana tree evokes an experience from me. So actually that's our life. You know, we think we're a think, we think we're a think it, but we're not, we're a do it. So all that is, all that Kongan is doing is evoking that experience that you are actually a just now do it, which we call it, you know, a, it's a don't know moment. Okay, so it's, I think the best way is to think of it as evocative. It's a technique which evokes something. You know? So when... Um, when Lin Chi Zen Master goes into Wang Po and asks him what's the meaning of Buddhism, he just beats the crap out of him with a with his with his stick. You know, he's not explaining anything to him, obviously. <laughs> and then he crawls out of the room and he comes back two more times. And then it's really interesting because then uh, Wang Po sends him off to this teacher called uh, Da Yu. So Da Yu means big stupid. Right, so all of that is intended to uh, create stu stupidity in Lin Chi's mind, and then when Big Stupid points that out to him, poof, ah, he gets it. Right, so yeah, that's the banana tree's job. Help this stupid guy from Kansas, <laughs> and that's the Kungan's job. Help, help that. Stupidly atrius over there in Topeka <laughs> and help me. So it's all about that. It's, it's uh, evocative. It may seem cruel, right? Or it may seem insensitive. Or it may say, oh, I don't like going to Kung on interviews because I can never answer the question. Right? So that's, that's your like and dislike mind talking. But that isn't what it's about. It isn't even about the Kung on. 
It's about, you know, the Kongan is just a technique to allow you to realize what you truly are, to have you let go of your opposites thinking mind and directly experience this moment in this situation, right? So Buddha got enlightenment looking at the morning star. Did you ever see a morning star? Yeah, probably thousands of times, right? But that isn't what it's about. It's about he experiences it in this, uh, I guess I would say, evocative moment. And boom. Just like the sixth patriarch, here's this one line from the sutra. Pow. You know, he hadn't been sitting around underneath a tree for six years. He's walking out of a shop <laughs> in Guangzhou. I've been to Guangzhou several times. Don't want to go to the wet markets there. I know that. Boy. <laughs> but that's the way wet markets are, <laughs> even in Singapore. So you get that experience, right? It's not based on your uh, like and dislike mind. So that's the Kongan's job. Very interesting technique. Any other questions? Thank you. Welcome. Dave Kwong Sunin? Yes. This is a question, now hopefully it's not too much off topic, I don't think it is, but in reading the, the first chapter of the Platform Sutra and just in general about Kongan practice, there's times I've thought there's similarities between the transcendentalists and like Walt Whitman, Song of Myself. There's times I've, I, I listen to the transcendentalists and I read that poetry and the writing and it's very Zen-like, it's very Kongan-like. I just wonder if you had any thoughts about that or... Yeah, because many traditions, that, that Christian mystical tradition and Taoism, um, uh, obviously, uh, have discovered this kind of technique. It's just been formalized in a particular kind of way within Zen, right? So uh, mystics, you know, if you read Meister Eckhart or something, you know, he'll be talking about what the hell is he talking about, right? But that's designed that way because he's pointing to... Uh, an experience which can't be explained, right? So Christian mystics are always uh, portrayed as uh, being woo 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 woo. Well, they're woo 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 for a reason because what they're talking about, in this case, God or some mystical experience of what we call God, is uh, beyond explanation. You know, that's why uh, uh, Christian theologians will give up. You know, like I used to teach at this Catholic college here in Kansas, and uh, I was friends with the um, I was friends with the head of theology at the college. There's a Catholic priest, and then one day he looked at me and said, "Yeah, I have to teach about this stuff, but you know, I don't believe in God." And I, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, you're the you're the head of teaching theology at this college, <laughs> and you don't believe in God, right? So. He's, it's not that he doesn't believe in God. He doesn't believe in the explanation of God, right? Because you can't explain God because God is beyond dualistic thinking, right? And uh, in Zen, we just say God is uh, just another name for that which cannot be named, right? So we say don't know mind is, it's don't know, it's your original nature, it's your true nature, it's God, it's the Tao, it's... Rama, the god Rama, it's, you know, whatever. So there's many, many names. In fact, there's probably more names for this thing that cannot be named than there are names for anything else, which is kind of ironic, but it's just the way human discourse operates, right? So if you're not attached to the word God, you might actually have a chance of experiencing God. If you're attached to that idea, it's probably true you will never have. So that's, that's why those Christian mystics, uh, talk that way but it's a particular style of talking about that which cannot be talked about as zen is a particular teaching style to talk about that which cannot be talked about and Taoists definitely have a way of talking about i mean the first line of the Tao Te Ching is that which can can be talked about is not the Tao. Right? the Tao, the Tao that can be spoken of is not the Tao. so that makes the same point in fact, these original uh, techniques, which are attached to our Zen history, were probably borrowed from Taoism originally. You know, because there's all this stuff is being mixed up together when Buddhism, let's see, Buddhism comes to China in 70 AD, and then it starts mixing with uh, 
whatever Taoist traditions have been there for a long, long time, and Confucian traditions, and it all gets mixed up and stirred up in the pot. And then you, you get this new little uh, soup called uh, Zen. So yeah, all, of, all those things, uh, they're just different styles of teaching. I wouldn't say one was better than the other. I like the Zen one because it's very direct, but you know, Zen Master Sun Zong took uh, Christian teachings and made Christian kumans. You know? For sure there's Christian kumans, right? And then there's uh, Taoist kumans, there's whatever. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, that kind of, it's interesting because if you practice koan, and then you read that mystical Christian stuff, you actually understand it. But if you're reading it from the point of view of, I'm going to read this and understand it, well, you don't understand it. And you're, uh, right? <laughs> so actually uh, practicing any kind of direct experience, mystical teaching kind of blah, 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 uh, will give you an experience that allows you to understand these other things, these other teaching traditions. I mean, that's a casual aside, but most important is experiencing what you really are, which is uh, before opposites thinking or before attachment mind gets a hold of the whole thing and messes it up. Any other questions? Thank you, Mike. Anybody? Any? Oh, this isn't too intellectual. It's not intended to be intellectual. <laughs> it's so like neat. intellectual talk about how to smash your intellectual mind. <laughs> yes. Uh, so have you, uh, uh, it is interesting when I read stuff in Chinese, uh, Zhongzi has a lot to do with Zen yes, uh, right. practice, but we never heard about it here uh, in the state, uh -huh. I mean, the West. Yeah. Well, I mean, the people that wrote this sutra, they would just assume you know the Zhongzi inside and out, right? <laughs> because it's within their cultural tradition or context, right? But when we read Zen, uh, when, you're, when you're in Topeka and you're reading a book on Zen, you know very little about the Zhongzi, right? Hor Hui Nong, or who was Kung Fu <laughs> Well, confusion isn't what. <laughs> so when I moved to Singapore, it's really interesting to live in foreign countries. I know like, there's a there's there's this um, a Tibetan tradition uh, that says you never, if you become a monk or a nun, you never want to live in the country you're born in. You want to move to a different country, preferably one in a different, with a different, completely different cultural context, right? Because it's instructive. Because you have all of these likes and dislikes that are based on culture. And then you go to another culture, and the whole thing is blown up, right? So if you go to Mexico, that might happen, but that's not far enough away anyway. I, so I went to Singapore. So it's really interesting because they are not in the Indo-European, Greco, Roman, Christian, Jewish tradition. They're in this Confucian tradition. You know? So I'm always running into these really interesting situations where, <laughs> you know, well, they don't think like us in very basic fundamental kinds of ways because they're in this uh, Taoist, Confucian, and of late Buddhist uh, tradition, at least since the time of Christ. So uh, when you go there, I'm always bumping into this. It kind of brings out the cultural anthropologist in me. I'm <laughs> always bumping into these situations where it's just not computing for me. And usually it's not computing computing for me because I'm thinking about it in some kind of uh, Greek philosophical phenomenological way you know <laughs> and they're just thinking about it in some kind of okay we got to go to the temple to light incense before the ancestors kind of way right? <laughs> I mean it happens all the time and it's just uh, very instructive you know how you you are attached to a particular uh, mind and that's the way your likes and dislikes play out. And uh, over there somewhere else, it's something. And if you're a Hopi Indian, it's something completely different. I mean, Hopis don't even have past, present, and future. So, and we're always thinking the past, present, and future. I mean, like, God, what's gonna happen next month? <laughs> right? <laughs> that's, that's the way we think. 
Okay. So okay. yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> Any other questions? Any kind of questions? Okay. So I'm going to ask you another one because you taught this class a long time ago at PZC. And you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you did talk about uh, how when Indian Buddhism came to China and how China, the Chinese people had took all the gods and deity out of it and had uh, this particular uh, document has a lot to do with uh, the culture itself uh, is very grounded on people on earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you talk about that like a great deal at that time, you know, it was very interesting, yeah. Right, so it's, uh, it's like uh, Meister Eckhart floating up in the clouds kind of language, which is a technique, versus dried shit on a stick language, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I went to Uman's temple there and I, I don't think they've washed the toilet since then, at least when I was there. <laughs> I'm sure they have now. It's a big birth site. <laughs> There's no stick leaning against the outhouse there anymore. <laughs> Yeah, right. So that's, yeah, that's one interesting dimension of Zen. You know, it drags everything down into the dirt. And that's because that's where, that's where the experience is. It's in the dirt. It's not, in, you know, massaging some transcendental concepts or something. Yeah, it's a kind of technique. <laughs> Any other questions? So. Sanem, I don't know if this is so much a question or not. Um, it's Jennifer talking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if I have a question to go with this, but it's always amazed me because we now have a Kongan to hit back at Hui Nung's poem, right? Right. And that just kind of amazes me, and I, maybe you can speak on it, that we're expected to hit back at one of our ancestors. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. It's all and about just, hitting their teacher. Right. <laughs> yeah. This is what Wait. she is awakening. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's not a t attachment to anything, right? So if you're, uh, if you're attached to the teacher, that's going to be a problem too, right? So uh, that whole thing about the boat, Who's going to row the boat to get uh, uh, Hui Nung to this place where you can escape all these people that are chasing him? So that story is about that, right? He's he's going to. It's about becoming independent. So hitting hitting the teacher is kind of an expression of independence from uh, not only text or teaching, but also the person or whatever. So one reason I love Zen Master Sung Sung is. He never used this guru style, you know, oh, guru, you're so great, you know. It was always like, anytime he did that, he just pulled the rug out from under you and you'd fall back on your ass and hit your head against the wall or something, because he never did that style. So Zen, Zen is not based on a guru style. It's based on uh, uh, providing a direct experience, right? So uh, uh, that's why... Uh, 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 Zen tends to be kind of uh, uh, unholy, <laughs> right? seemingly disrespectful, you know, like if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Well, nobody says if you meet Jesus on the road, kill him, right? Nobody says that. But that's just a different style, you know, and the style of this, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him, is you have to know for yourself. It's about you having the experience directly. So it's not dependent on a teacher, on a text, on what anybody else said. It's based on your own direct experience in this moment. Okay, that's what that's about. Holy teachers are a dime a dozen. In Zen, we'd want to blow them all up. By the way, Sunim, I have yeah. one comment I want to make real quick. Um, I'm taking a rare books class, and actually, of all things, the Diamond Sutra, if I remember correctly, is the earliest printed text. Right. 
And so it was kind of interesting that you were talking about how old and how early the platform sutra was, and then the diamond sutra is the one that's the earliest printed. Oh, right, 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 right. That's because uh, in the story, he's going to paint on the wall some scenes from the Lanka Avatara Sutra, but he says, no, no, don't paint it. And then they write the poems on the wall, right? So those poems replace the Lanka. So the Lanka is the sutra that Bodhidharma brought to China in the sixth century. But it, then it's supplanted by the Diamond Sutra, which is the basis of, of the Platform Sutra. So one way to look at the, this Platform Sutra is, is it's just an explication or a way to make the Diamond Sutra appear in direct experience. So it's all about that transforming uh, of, of Zen teaching from Bodhidharma based on the Lanka versus uh, the Platform Sutra, which is based on the Diamond Sutra, which you're right, is the, supposedly the first book that was ever printed. It's about what, how many, what is it, four, 500 years before the Gutenberg Bible, something like that. Yeah, it's printed in the, in the third or fourth, fourth century, fourth or fifth century, something like that. Yeah, yeah you're right. Any other questions? <laughs> Here's a practice question. I, uh, I think I heard that uh, both uh, Singapore Sangha and Hong Kong Sangha actually chant the Diamond Sutra. Is it every Friday night? Yep. How do I take every for Friday night. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's a standard uh, kind of uh, traditional Buddhist practice. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's true. Takes about an hour if you okay. if you speed right through it. <laughs> it's much shorter in Chinese because <laughs> Chinese is a monosyllabic language, right? So they can really motor through it. Yeah, it's kind of like a mantra or something. The interesting thing is nobody understands what it says, <laughs> so I get a lot of mileage out of it because they they may have it memorized, but they don't really know what it means. I don't know what it means either, but I can. You know, I can, uh, you can talk or you can use it to talk around to point towards something about having an experience, right? So uh, if the Diamond Sutra says, past mind can't get enlightenment, present mind can't get enlightenment, future mind can't get enlightenment, then boom, right? Out of that can come a kongan and, and push you off the edge of your thinking mind into the abyss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. But our, our Zen center in uh, Singapore is also a uh, Buddhist temple, a traditional Buddhist temple on some level. So they do some traditional Buddhist things as well as all the Zen things. So here in the United States, the religious dimension of Buddhism has almost been erased. It's almost pure Zen, right? When you go to the Zen center. Although we do have some things, we have marriage ceremonies, funerals, stuff like that. And we do chanting, but our chanting is part of a Zen practice regime. It's not part of a regime to, to build, pile up merit by chanting something, 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 something. So that's a difference. Any other questions? I had a question. Um, this is Jane. Hi, Jane. Uh, our, it, it, when I was reading this, it seemed um, Huineng was just a woodcutter and then he's walking around and he hears this one line from the sutra and gets enlightenment and then goes and works in the kitchen and writes this poem and becomes the sixth patriarch is there anything missing in there because i mean or are there other Mm, patriarchs or people, Zen people who have not practiced a lot and still. Yeah, I don't know. How, I mean, that. That's about waking, yeah, it's about waking up, right? So even the six, even Hui Nung has all of these uh, so called Dharma heirs, you know, people that consider him their teacher. So there's many, 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 many of those. So you might not know who they are. So for some reasons, 
one kind of what we call a lineage is played up as, you know, here's a, here's a Hong Ren, and then here's uh, Bai Zhang, and here's Matsu, and here's Lin Chi, blah, blah, blah. So, but that's just all advertising. Right. right. But he didn't appear to do the kind of practice, hard practice. Oh, yeah, none. That's because he's in, the sudden, he's in the sudden school. But that doesn't mean his mind isn't clear. I mean, some people practice their whole life and their minds are just as muddy as before. And some people don't practice at all and they're already clear. You know these people, right? So it's, uh, practicing isn't to get something. So if you think about practicing and getting something, well, wait, the six patriarch didn't practice. What did he get? Well, <laughs> he returned to his true self in this moment. Right. So that's the point of that. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. 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 Cool. Cool. <laughs> Please. So, yeah, so it's Andy in the UK. So um, it's the first time I've uh, read the uh, Platform Sutra and your, uh, and your uh, chapter on it. And uh, one thing I really enjoyed is um, perhaps it's, uh, it's a good lesson in the pitfalls of having a special mind. Um, I really enjoyed that uh, because it seems that the other protagonists in the in the sutra they all have they all have some kind of ego they all kind of really want something whereas the sixth patriarch he doesn't really want anything as far as unless I totally misunderstand it but he lead, leads a more authentic life Mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, and and that's what and just on my first reading uh, that's one of the things I noticed like ah oh, these guys they all have special Very mind important. they all really want something right whereas right. the six patriot doesn't want anything at all yeah that's what's so radical about Buddhism and Zen is you already have it right after right. the Buddha got enlightenment he said how wonderful everybody already has it so that means there's nothing to get it's mm -hmm. and then he's then he continues and says but human beings don't understand that because they don't understand that they already have Buddha nature, they suffer. And that's exactly what you said, because they want something, right? Right. So when the sixth patriarch gets enlightenment there, he realizes he, this is it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, you are exactly correct. You picked up on exactly the theme you should have. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's why it's good teaching. It's yeah. very clear, very simple, doesn't, uh, doesn't involve anything except having an experience. Just like a banana doesn't involve hardly anything except having an experience. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. What time is it there? Um, I'm not sure. Let me just see. It is, um, we're six hours ahead. Yeah, five out. It's five after five o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah it is um, five seventeen. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Zen master, I have a yes. question. Sarah. Yes, Zen master. You always say when thinking, when thinking arises, don't attach to it. When karma arises then we try not to attach to it and make use of the karma to help other people. Right. But how about if this karma is, um, is like something like a problem, we have to attach to it in order to, to make use of it, isn't it? Right. So there's two kinds of attachment. There's big attachment and small attachment. This is what Zen Master Sung Song called big I want and small I want. So small I want is what leads to suffering, right? Like I want a really good latte after this class is over, or I want to get a new car, or I want this virus to go away. So, well, you could, that could be big or small. But usually our minds are occupied with a small I want. But then there's a big I want, which is I want to help the world. So Zen means find your true self and help the world. So you're not finding your true self for you. You're realizing your true self is, is what allows you to help the world, right? So then you can use all of your uh, small I wants, that's your good karma or your bad karma, to help the world. 
So the sixth pat patriarch uses his, I guess he has some bad karma, right? But then he's able to utilize that. You know, it's shocking that this uh, woodcutter is suddenly teaching all these sutras at a big temple in Guangzhou of all places. So, um, and uh, 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 recently I thought, well, this even applies to boredom. So uh, you're in some kind of lockdown, right? Maybe because of the virus. Then you could even think of boredom as like, there's different kinds of boredom. There's, uh, I, I would call it, there's like big boredom and small boredom. So if you ever did a long retreat, you know, like a hundred day solo retreat, I mean, there's nothing more boring in the world. If you think the lockdown is boring, try a hundred day solo retreat. It's really boring. So, or, or a kilche or a longer retreat or even a one day retreat is pretty boring, right? You could be doing better things than sitting there looking at the floor for God's sakes. So, uh, but I would call that big boredom because it has, you know, it has a big results to help the world. While the small boredom is, you know, you're so, you're so bored with your kids because you're at home with them all the time that you want to strangle them. So that's the, the result of a small boredom. So, but that applies to probably everything. I, I never thought about any other dimensions of it, but it's certainly true of uh, big I want versus small I want. So once you realize that, then you can use your small I want mind, which is your like and dislike mind, uh, then you understand it. So you can use that wisdom to help the world. So that's, that's the idea, right? It's not about getting rid of your bad karma or your good karma. It's about using them or not attaching to them and then using them to help, help the world. Okay. okay. Um, That's how you can use big boredom and small boredom too. Small boredom drives you nuts. Big boredom actually makes you sane. <laughs> Uh, this is Vera, and I'm new. Uh, what was your road to Singapore? How did you know this was the place for you? Uh, the food is great. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, any... In, through anybody's life, you're led in certain directions, and it's usually by your like and dislike mind, right? So if you let go of that, you can use that circumstance, whatever it is, uh, hopefully to help the world. So you just have to try given your situation, whatever it is. So if you're if you're the if you're the kid, hopefully you can use being a kid to help the world. If you're a grandfather, you can use being a grandfather to help the world. If you're an IT worker, you can use IT. And if you're a bartender and you're skillful, you can use it being a bartender to help the world, right? So a lot of those people sitting there drinking are actually looking for advice, in my experience anyway. <laughs> so you can use that to help them, right? So uh, that's true of everything in life. So it has all, everything has to do with intention. So I didn't actually go to Singapore with the intention of being able to experience all the good food there. Although if you go there, you will, right? But uh, hopefully that isn't my only reason for being there when I was there, <laughs> although it does happen. So everything in, in Buddhism is about your intention and your intention in this moment, right? So what's your intention this moment? So don't attach what went on in the past and don't attach about any, your idea about what might go on in the future. How do you use this moment and what's happening? Now, that's the result of cause and effect, which you might call your karma. And, and we might think about that karma as good or bad. So uh, Hui Neng used his bad karma, which was to be born to this ex-Chinese official in this crummy province of Guangdong in southern China. He used all of that to help the world. In fact, he's still helping the world today. You know, but you don't want to attach to it. He, so he was able to turn all that around and use it to uh, benefit the world. Okay, does that make sense? Somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about intention. <laughs> yeah, it's about intention. So that intention can manifest itself in whatever situation your karma leads you to be in. So right now, my karma has led me to be in this really old guy's body, right? 
So how can I use that to help the world? Or um, Andy's karma has led him to be living in England rather than Kansas. So how can he use that situation to help the world? So your karma will play out in, in myriad ways. You know, that's uh, the whole Indra's net thing. It's all wrapped up together in a, in a not so tidy package. Then how do you use that package to actually help the world? So that's all about intention. So the intention within uh, uh, Mahayana Buddhism, which Zen is part of, is to help the world. So Zen means find your true self help the world. Actually, those two things are just one thing, but we like to pull them apart so we can have something to say about for an hour and a half. Okay? Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, maybe that's enough. We've been here for an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> I want to thank you all for uh, joining today and listening from all over the world, Singapore, England. Wow, easy. So uh, most important out of this is uh, uh, do some just now practicing, right? All of meditation practice is about keeping a just now mind. So just now, uh, anybody, just like Wei Nung, woke up walking out of a shop after delivering some firewood, anybody can wake up in this moment. You know, and then you use the wisdom that comes from that to help the world. So we uh, wake up to find our true self and then help the world. So uh, practicing is, is uh, not special, it's just a technique for doing that. So you can do that with that intention. You can wash the dishes with a clear intention too. So it's about this moment. What are you doing? Just do it. Then you become one, which is the big message of the Buddha. So when the Buddha realizes his true self, he becomes one with the planet Venus, right? The morning star. And uh, Huai Ning became one uh, when he heard that monk chanting that sutra outside of a shop. And then later when the fifth patriarch uh, uh, explained a line to him, oh, he woke up to just that moment. So uh, yeah. The bananas are pointing up, but you have to wake up to realize that and know how to use that to help the world, okay? So thank you all for listening and just do it, then you get it. Thinking, 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 you just get a headache, right? An existential headache. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for coming and listening this morning.